Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here today. I have transitioned from university-based practice into private practice. I have become more an AAPS typical person in the past year. It's been a lot of hectic going on in my life, which is why being the new man on the block in the group that I'm with, I don't get the time off I want, but I'm happy to be here today to represent Mock, Mole, and OCC for those DOs in the crowd. I'm a graduate of a foreign medical college founded in 1457 that has the, the bad news that I see things different than most Americans. If you go to Europe, there's excellent care and there is no board system, okay? So people ask, well, we should do a randomized control study to see if board certification matters. Well, it does not matter because Europe exists just fine. They have wonderful health care there. Uh, their longevity is longer, their child mortality is less. The reasons are multiple, but if you want the randomized controlled study, it's already been done and it's being done every day. Opposition grows. The good news first. Several states have passed resolutions in their medical societies. Ohio was one of the pioneering ones because the FSMB came to us and wanted to force their Ponzi-like scheme of maintenance of licensure upon all physicians, conscripting everyone into a program of recertification based on licensure. And when uh, Ken Chrisman and I first took this mission to the Ohio State Medical Society. Within a year, we, we put it to the test, and as the uh, vote was, was taken, the next day the director of the state medical board was looking for a new job. So activism is important, not just education, but activism. I think everyone in this room should be a member in two societies, the AAPS, because it is the only national society attacking this monster and any other society that's a major society in your state because at the state level is the only way to go. The national societies have all bought into this maintenance of certification money machine. They will make even more money than the American board systems and the American board's cumulative income runs currently around $375 million a year and they haven't even really implemented the maintenance of certification. They're struggling to do so as you'll see. So you can't rely on the national societies at this point, but I am in my national society. I keep hacking at them and trying to make things work. I said I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm basically into risk management, and I'm going to talk a lot about advertisement today. Board certification arose as an advertising scheme for doctors who wanted to put themselves out there and be recognized as better in some way, and I'll come back to that. I'm just going to move forward and say I've been tasked with reading productions from the boards, their members, their membership, the publications in the journals, and I'm gonna go through that relatively quickly, but you'll have things in your packet to refer back to. There's a lot of nonsense being published as if it was science when it is in reality only advertisement. Now, the thing that caught the American Board of Internal Medicine's eye was this petition, should we recall the changes of maintenance of certification? This was formulated by uh, uh, a Paul Tierstein in La Jolla, California, worked at Scripps University. He is an academic uh, cardiologist. Cardiologists got upset, and he used the methodology of going to the membership rosters of the cardiologists, buying it for a fee, and sending emails to everyone on there asking them to sign up. And currently, as of August of 28, they had over 18,000 signatures saying, this should be recalled, and that made note with the ABIM and took them to task. Subsequently, this article was published here by Dr. Barron and Dr. Johnson, uh, again, trying to deal with the fact that this uh, confrontation occurred, and it's important, I've highlighted a few things. In 68, they decided to discontinue lifetime certification, but ultimately concluded that the ABMS, ABM, ABIM didn't have the capacity to develop a program of forcing you to do it. In 80, uh, 86, they tried to do it. They recognized people would not buy a voluntary program for recertification. They were instrumental in forcing the new specialties, family practice and emergency medicine to be founded based on time-limited certification because they were the competition. It's important to recognize that this is an advertising scheme and its design is that of, of limiting competition. You can't fly in from Europe as a professor of a university and work here in the United States. You've got to do residency all over because you've got to get certified. 
Certification is a plague on the economics of America. You can't buy a radio without having the UL sticker on there. You can't practice medicine with the, without the board certification sticker on there. And you're going to see that this is truly a Ponzi-like scheme, as uh, Dr. Huntoon had, had indicated. So they've, they've tried to buff it up. They've tried to make it seem more appealing, more, more real, more effective, more uh, 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 demonstrative of competence. But you can, we all took high school and college tests. You cram for the test. You sign off at it. Who here can recite the first five elements in the periodic table? We all took chemistry. I know I can't, and I don't even want to. And this is the sort of uh, task that they put upon us as physicians. And physicians is the most one of the most trusted uh, professions in the country. And yet we're guilty until we can prove we're better than whatever someone wants. This was a response that was issued. And yes, internists have serious concerns over the new demands that milk process entails are palpable. Too many internists find some aspects of the current process lacking at a time when concerns about the ramifications of this high stakes professional endeavor are increasing. Yes, if you time out your certificate and you're no longer board certified, hospitals will throw you off the staff. What will happen to your patients? Well, it's very easy. Obamacare says we're going to pay nurse practitioners and physician's assistants a reduced rate. I think the ultimate goal is to get rid of physicians as a profession and supplant them with less educated, uh, less paid nurses and other specialists to take over because they will be ready to believe the guidelines that these people publish while they're working on the pharmaceutical boards. Okay. Next came the, the pledge to not recertify. And you see, there's only about 5,000 signatures, which I think is a significant number. However, people are afraid. The, the, you know, I, I've gotten out there. I've, I've put my life on the line. I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to yell it from the rooftops. I am not afraid of, of, of the boards. And they've never called me to task. I've not been in a lawsuit yet. Maybe it'll come. I don't know. But I believe, as an American, if you speak the truth, you can't be sued for it. And so I urge everyone to notice this URL, sign up for it, tell your, your you don't have to be an ABIM doc. I think everyone in every specialty should unite behind this and give voice to the fact that no, I will not comply with this Ponzi scheme. And I'm gonna use, I always try to use regulatory capture as an economic term that's been around for decades because it's more palatable when you're talking to these people. but. It's extortion, just like the mafia has it. That's what this is. So we've put the message out there. People are paying attention. The American College of Physicians has gotten a little bit of rise because their membership is saying there's something wrong. Something is rotten in Denmark, and Denmark is the American Board of Medical Specialties. So other societies are coming up and banding and saying we have to stop this. But they're all afraid a little bit, as they have many members of the boards in their bodies. And so they try to mitigate it and try to decide, how can we improve this derogatory thing? Well, you can't improve on death, and this thing needs to die. The American College of Cardiology, I refer back to Dr. Tierstein. They were one of the stronger voices here. They have made uh, statements. Most members responded to the survey are aware of the recent changes and are not as familiar as all the particulars, but strong opposition is there. This is a forced on us product, and doctors, we get along to get along, and that's one of our weaknesses. We need to stand up for our rights. Freedom ain't free, and the only rights worth having are those worth standing up for. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine spoke out and said, this is not good, we need to oppose this. So we see that societies and societies have made these decisions based on the membership here going there and informing the members of those societies just exactly what it is. And I'm going to try to bring you up to date on that. So their concerns were the high milk costs, the educational redundancy, the arbitrary requirement for maintenance of multiple certifications, you know, sleep medicine, internal medicine, or whatever, the milk process inefficiencies, the things that they make you do just to 
be able to take their stinking test, and the inadequate specialty representation. These are companies. These are nonprofit companies, and just because you're a nonprofit company doesn't make you a morally good company in any way, shape, or form. It just means you can't hand out stock options, so you got to pay the people on the board a lot of money to make the no profit, and the profits of the 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 executive of the pediatric board, which grossed $2 million in, in it, 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 the total fees were $24 million. They grossed or maintained $2 million onto their, uh, their, their balance books, but paid the CEO $1.3 million to run the pediatric board. How many pediatri pediatricians out there make a fifth of that? Okay, this is a Ponzi scheme. It all funnels up to the top. This is my board. I've had a lot of contention with them. They've sent out a nice little survey, asked people to answer the questions, but the surveys are always designed on the basis of how can we improve this terrible thing, and they don't ask the questions, is this any good at all? How can we make it better? But they find that people are not happy with that which they are putting out there. So the boards are starting to take notice, and as an advertising corporation, they try to sell your credentials as a good advertisement to the patient population out there. They know the ins and the outs of the advertising business as well, and they're willing to use this. Now, I wrote a little bit about dissecting the issues here. It made it into the uh, med page today here about four weeks ago. And I went into the issue that in the ABIM and the family practice, people taking the test, the fail rates are reaching 33%. Now, if you're out there practicing medicine, and you have to recertify, and you take the test, and these are competent physicians, and you're failing 33% of them, there's a problem with the test, not with the physicians, okay? <laughs> That's number one. And number two is, these are our primary care physicians of which there is a severe shortage. And number three is, these people are at risk of being thrown out of practice, out of insurance company payment systems, and we're gonna to see too that the, even Medicare and Medicaid are gonna tax you 2% of your gross earnings if you don't comply with MOOC, and if you fail the test, well, you're out. It's another scheme by the government to reduce payments to physicians, and number four, because there's this shortage and we're making it harder, we're gonna to have to hire more nurse practitioners and, and uh, physician's assistants who can take care of the primary care for you. And so the numbers were this, and this was from the ABIM's own newsletter, not a newsletter, the people who took the test got the results, and this was handed to me from someone who had taken the ABIM test as their data. 3,400 took the test, 65% pass rate, that's, that's a crime, okay? Thus, 1,194 failed. 1,867 were first time recertification attempts, and that subset, the pass rate was 80%. So 20% of physicians who are out there practicing medicine and recertified for the first time, that means you know, you're doing good. Well, now you're an idiot, 20%. That leaves 1,546 repeat or non-first time recertification testers, of which 821 failed. That suggests a 53% failure rate among that group of experienced and practicing physicians. So people have, this recertification has been out there a while. The first time you're down to 80, and after that you can go as far as 53%. What are they testing? Well, who can tell me the first five elements on a periodic table? Something you learned a long time ago, nonsense that you really probably don't need to know, or as a physician who's been practicing for 30 years, when a new guideline comes out, the first response is, who wrote this and what's it worth? People coming out of residency, that's all they've known. These are the laws, the rules that we've had to abide by. They've just been schooled out. They only have maximum 60 hours of work week, so they got time to study these guidelines. Yeah, they can regurgitate them. But you and me out there practicing, a new guideline comes out. Uh, we don't always buy it, and that's where we get in trouble on tests. You have to learn to take the test. And I repeatedly state I've never learned anything for or anything from a board test because I learn every day. I mean, I'm an idiot. I, medicine is my hobby. I'm an idiot. Okay. Um, making the uncertified un unwanted, I think, is a problem. The FTC has uh, 
taken action against uh, the dentists who tried to preclude dental hygienists from doing teeth whitening because it's a restraint of trade. Now, if you're going to take licensed physicians because they're not certified and toss them aside and replace them with nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, that sounds like an unlawful restraint of trade, and it's nationwide. It's time for the FTC to take up this battle, and I hope this organization, as the nation's leader in reason, might be able to incorporate a few federal uh, agents to get this analyzed. Walmart wants to open up stores. We're talking about how can we make care cheaper? Well, there aren't going to be doctors sitting in Walmart. There are going to be nurse practitioners. And I've had an episode of nurse practitioner care working at the Cleveland Clinic. I hurt my knee at an operating room table, fell on me. I had to go to the ER because that's the way the plan was. And I spent two and a half hours, uh, it was mostly my time because it's at the end of the day, and was treated by a nurse practitioner. I had a soft tissue swelling, and they had to make an x-ray. There was nothing broken. I told her, you don't need an x-ray. You're going to find some arthritis because I'm 57 years old. And indeed, that's what it found. So nurse practitioners, they're cheaper by the hour to pay them. They don't work 60, 80 hours a week, so in reality, you're not going to be any cheaper. And they order more unnecessary tests, and they don't give better care. So we're going to dumb down medicine. Thank you, Dr. Obama. Uh, now I want to talk about ethics a little bit, because this is the thing that's confronted me the most about this whole thing, is the lack of ethics associated with the boards. Ethics refers to the standards of behavior that tell us how human beings ought to act in many situations in which they find themselves as friends, parents, children, citizens, etc. And, and altruism, do the right thing. It's the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you, not the business one. He with the gold rules, maximizing returns at all costs. This is the problem we have with uh, evidence-based medicine and ethics. It's not what it should be. Beneficence, patients should have benefits from this testing. We do not. The boards, the FSMB, these testing organizations are physician adverse organizations living off the backs of rich doctors so that they can make their income and exert political pressure to the advantage of them, typically being academic people who don't want to care for patients but would rather just tell everyone else what to do and see if it happens. Uh, Non-malfeasance, this stuff is bad for doctors. If you're throwing people off a of staff because they don't comply with your corporate scheme, that's not beneficial, and there's no justice to it. There was a time when professional advertising was forbidden, and it's still forbidden in some states in Europe. Um, probably one of the reasons why the boards may not have caught on there as they have caught on here. The AMA Code of Ethics in 1847 prescribed it, However, in 1975, the Federal Trade Commission stepped in based on actions of lawyers. Someone tried to get uh, a deed uh, uh, changed or, or, or a will written and tried to find competitive rates, and they were unable to do so. So the, FT, the Federal Trade Commission stepped in and said, this is a restraint of trade. People need to be able to see what the prices are and choose from it. Same as with medicine right now. No one knows if your appendectomy is going to cost $2,000 or $102,000. It all depends on your insurance company and what the negotiated rates are. And if you don't have one, Larry didn't mention this, but I think the sole purpose of insurance companies and Medicare Medicaid is to push the prices down by forcing people to take a nickel on the dollar. This is one of the problems. But in 75, the FTC made the ruling and the AMA noticed it and then they stopped prohibiting uh, 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 advertising as an issue. So that was the original code. This is the new one. And then it said it is derogatory to the dig dignity of the profession to resort to public advertisements. And that was the rule. Then it was changed. And now we have to deal with the fact that the expense of professional altruism is being subjugated to advertising. Now we, we need to advertise ourselves. The JCAH goes around, studies hospitals. The uh, US News and World Report comes out and rates them based on some arbitrary scale. And these hospital administrators all go bananas 
it, because they have to get that good rating. And we've all been there when JCH comes through, they hide the stuff from the hallways and make the passages clear, <laughs> come through and tell you, if they ask you this question, this is the answer. What are the three components of an OR fire? Well, you gotta have oxygen, you gotta have a substrate, and you gotta have ignition. Make sure you say that, okay? This is, this is the kind of nonsense that we have to do because the hospital administrators will make your life hard. Uh, advertisement, if you flew in today, you saw this in one of the airline magazines. I flew Delta last week. They had four of those, four pages in a row with the best whatever surgeons in New York or in the world or whatever. And these people, you know, they're top doctors and they're also board certified. They gotta put that up there, it's all part of the scheme. And here, you know, your center, advertising is ubiquitous in America now for hospitals, for physicians. And the problem with uh, before 1975 and the boards was, you couldn't advertise, but you could say you were board certified, and that was an advertisement that was supposed to mean that people recognize you as being better than the rest. But I fly a lot, and I sit there, and I talk to the people next to me, and unless they're a doctor, a nurse, or a healthcare professional, when you go home, ask them, do you know what board certified means? And dollars to donuts, 99% of patients won't even know. People read that stuff, and, and they have no idea what that means. Um, Okay, certification and MOC compliance, it's an advertisement. I've, I've said that to death. There's the statement on my first certificate from 1989. It, is, it attested that I was qualified to serve as a consultant in anesthesiology. And now it just says that I've uh, reached the requirements of the board and is awarded a maintenance of certification in the specialty of anesthesiology. Well, that doesn't sound very thrilling to me, but that's what it is. I paid for it. I, I, why did I get both of these? I never really thought much of it, but the first time they promised me at the university $5,000 a year more, I said, all right. And the second time they said, I think we need this stuff because we're academic and you know, uh, blah, blah, it would be good for you to do that. You get the drift, you do it because you're pushed into it. And that's the problem with this. People are forced into it. People are afraid to not have it. And it's, it's extortion, it's frank extortion. So advertising propaganda to entice individuals into the consumption of products for sale. The bait and switch, we just saw that. I was a consultant in anesthesiology, now maintenance of certification has really nothing to do with attaining anything at all. You're just, you're, you're paying your subscription rate for this piece of paper, which we can take away from you at any time if we so desire, and we'll see a little bit about that. So I talk about regulatory capture. The boards are using laws, are using political and economic pressure to force you into their programs and yes, they went to Congress and they lobbied the Congress to pass a law starting next year and in 2016, you will be fined 2% on your gross incomes from Medicare or Medicaid if you cannot additionally buy a certificate from your board every year to send in to prove that you're in compliance. It's not just enough to be in compliance, you gotta buy the document to prove it. And now, this is from the American Board of Dermatology. One of our colleagues sitting here sent me this, and it says, this recertification will remain in effect for 10 years, commencing on January 1, 2014. And then you read down here, and I'll blow it up for you. It's valid, contingent upon participation in and completion of maintenance of certification. And if you don't do that, don't pay your yearly fee, they can take it away from you, tell you to send it back, or renege on it and not have you the benefit of having that certificate at all. It's not yours, you've merely rented it. Well, you know, register to advertise. They're sending out these letters here, I've eliminated the address. Sign up for our American Board of Medical Specialties book. It's like the who's who's, remember in high school and college you got those things, fill it out, send it in, you are be in the who's who's and your mother will buy the book. Well, this is a lot like this. And this is the big text, I blew it up for you. It's basically, because these people, another certification industry giant, certification, I don't even know what the URAC is, but I don't want to know either, I have nightmares already. The ABMS's own statement on certification about two and a half years ago, a New England Journal of Medicine article was presented, published, and it raised questions among the physicians, and the uh, AB, ABMS felt obliged to produce a myths and facts page on their website. The website's theirs, you know, it's like a, it, it's an advertising uh, site for them. But they did state this, this is directly from there. They recognize that regardless of the profession, whether it is healthcare, law enforcement, education, or accounting, there is no certification that guarantees 
performance or positive outcomes. I mean, that's their words. I believe that. That's one of the few things I believe. Regulatory capture. In anesthesiology now, they require you pass the written board exam to graduate. And family medicine plan to incorporate maintenance of certification into residency training. We are going to make this at the very basic level an obligation for everyone to do. And if we don't stop it now, someone mentioned Hitler early. I hate to do that because I trained in Germany. Uh, and it also brings up bad connotations for a lot of people. But you have to cut them off at the knees. If we'd have stopped Hitler in the Rhineland in 33, we would have prevented a war. We didn't. If we don't take this serious now, and people are raising questions, go home, talk to your colleagues, have them sign up, go to your societies, be politically active, stop it now or forever pay the price. And what are they after? 2.5 billion CME gross cost to medicine on a yearly basis. This is from another certification giant, Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, which arose from the AMA's PRA program, the standard CME stuff. The, the whole thing about certification is they keep saying public demands that we have some validation of our physicians. Well, I've seen marches on Washington, the Million Man March, the war on Vietnam. I've never seen people go up marching saying doctors are stupid. I've not seen that. And you never will because doctors are not stupid. They're the cream of the crop. We're lifelong learners. And the AMA PRA award and CME accreditation developed to attest to our lifelong learning. That's why we get credits and why we send them into our state medical boards. A legal entity out there making sure that we do what we do. Why do we need a private corporation in addition to the state physician adverse organization making sure we comply at extra cost? And when I say that American Board of Medical Specialties grosses $3.75 million a year now, and it's only doomed to go up if this uh, becomes a reality. That's just the tip of the iceberg because the ACCME, uh, you have the, the, the MCATs testing, there are, you just don't know where to stop when you put the price tag on certification in medicine alone. And I'm afraid if I tried to bring it all together for certification in the United States, you can be a certified accountant, you can be a certified train operator, you can buy a cert, be a certified certifier for crying out loud. When you go down the whole list, it's gotta be billions of dollars on the backs of the American economy just because people want to be able to say, well, he says so, we're good. He says so, we're good. Yes, people seek out doctors based on referral, not on these referrals, but on referrals of family, other physicians, and hospitals, healthcare providers they come into contact with. And here it is, the regulatory capture. This is the scheme, it's a bait and switch. They start off awarding 1.5% or 0.5% to those who can demonstrate that they are maintaining their certification. But in 15, it's a minus 1.5 if you don't, and then minus 2% if you don't uh, be able to prove this. And the real joke on this, I went to the Freedom of Information Act. I asked the federal government, how much money did you pay out in 2011? Because that was the only data that was available when I did this a year and a half ago. And they paid out $1 million for this MOC PQRS phenomenon to 1,000 to, to applicants, of which only 500 got paid. So, but there's 850,000 doctors in the United States, of which 25% never certified. So they stand to gain billions with a B if they can start chopping this off. The whole business is about how do we not pay doctors? Now this just came out three days ago as an e-publication, and I wanna share this with you because it drove me nuts. Uh, this is in the, uh, in the journal Pediatrics, and they, did a little study, they, there was a NIH granted study which was out there trying to smoking cessation among kids and they were trying to enroll a pediatrician into it using a system, a network where 1,700 physicians were already registered with it to try and they only got half of the numbers they needed. And so they said, well, we're gonna start giving away MOOC points if we can make this into a QI project, stick it on the end of this study and just cold call people and try and find it. The original, they only had 1,700 people to work with. They said in this study there were 17,000 people. 
and there's only two things of statistical validity in this study. One, they were able to recruit people faster. Well, if we pay them, they will come. But they also have a bunch of board people have joined this original study who are very eager to try and get this to work. This is nothing but advertisement. There is no science to any of this. The reasons that they were able to enroll people quicker are multiple in the, in the background. And then the other uh, statistically relevant uh, finding was that the people that they then enrolled were not like the original group. So they changed something. They don't tell you what it is, but there's no science to it. And I just wanted to share that with you. So it misleadingly states that this was a registered trial. It, they used a registered trial, but they created a secondary thing, which was not found on the original website at the NIH. There was no IRB approval obtained. They call, it, they call it a QI. If we call it a QI, we can do studies on patients without informing them, much like Hitler's guys did way back when. That's why the Nuremberg Laws come out in 1947. You can't just take people and practice whatever you want and call it a study. They need to have informed consent. And this is what the ABMS is selling. They're trying to make every physician out there a research person for whatever the game is coming down. They're trying to find tools to make us do their bidding. And they even stated in there, they, they got these people, that they weren't signing up because they were too busy trying to do MOOC. They were too busy in their practice. But now, if we're gonna help provide these credits that you need, anyway, this is a captive audience. We don't do experiments on prisoners in jails because it's unethical. But if we could force doctors who we've already got to do our bidding, somehow that's more palatable. Okay, and the groups were found to be different. Now, the next time you even think about signing up, you can get this online from, what, you know, this is from the pathology boards. Everything in yellow are obligations upon you. This is a contract, and you're gonna sign it down here in order to take the test. And if you don't, you can't. So it's, it's forced. I hereby release, discharge, covenant not to sue and hold harmless the board and trustees, officers, blah, 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 blah. It says in here that if in a setting, in a, one of these test centers, 15 people come up with the exact same answers that are wrong and they suspect cheating took place, they can cancel the whole thing, make you come and do it again because you have no recourse. They are the final judge and jury on anything to do with board certification period, thank you very much, you signed it, I agree to be bound, et cetera, okay? It's, it's, it's an extortion program. Board certified is a registered trademark. There's problems with, there's another certification industry out there, the American Board of Physician Specialties that's been around for 65 years. They're less well known, they originated from a DO-based uh, uh, system, and they've tried in Texas to certify people. They currently certify, I think, about 14 specialties, one of which is anesthesiology, but the ABMS sued them and said, you can't call yourself board certified because we, we own it, okay? I mean, talk about proprietary interests, and now, Going back to the science of it all, I think it's important to refresh that which we've long forgotten from medical school. Today's random medical news. You know, in the past three years, coffee's been good, coffee's been bad, spin the wheel, now we know what it is for the next week or so. And why is that? Well, when you look at things and you get relative risk ratios and what, you know, you look for zones of potential bias. One is the standard group, and then when you get down to 0.33 or up to about three, risk relative index, then you're talking about something that's really worthwhile. And when we look at, and I encourage you, go out there and read some of these publications of the boards. You can put it into the PubMed and it pops up. This is how I keep getting them. And you know, it's pretty mind numbing stuff and takes a lot of time, but just do two or three of them and you'll see what kind of nonsense is in there. I just read on the way here an article, like if you get a stent put in your heart, in your heart and four weeks later stop taking your aspirin and Plavix, you've got a risk ratio of 10 that you're gonna have an MI. Now that's a real deal. But if it's 1.07, that's just, you know, that's nothing, particularly if it's retrospective reviewed by people who have an incentive to produce a result, the boards making their own studies, uh, risk adjusting things, it, it becomes laughable, but people don't read the studies, they read that little print in the summary that says, uh, an improvement or a whatever, a better thing was shown because we, we say so. So you wanna look at the risk ratios index, but you also wanna read the study and see if it's retrospective or not and figure out what it is they're selling. 
the reasons this, uh, the big, you know, the big data, the more numbers you can crunch, the better the p-value is going to be with the even more insignificant race, ra ra risk ratio difference. And this is what they're basing it upon. They go back and they get Medicare records from 1990 to 1999, which today is pretty much irrelevant. We're never designed for research basis. We're designed for billing primarily. And they've manipulated the data and adjusted risks and made cohorts and God knows what else and come up with their data. But academics, academicians have an appropriate imperative to publish. And you can get pretty much anything published if you submit it often enough or if you have friends on the boards. And that's the other problem with the boards is they're academicians. They really don't care much for taking care of patients. And they've infiltrated all the national societies who all own journals. And if they don't, we're going to see the boards publish their own journals. The American Board of Family Practice has a journal. And we'll see how funny that can get. So, Researchers are overzealous. You can get anything published, and they, it's, it's publish or perish. And if you're working with the boards, if you're on the boards, if you've got your members on the editorial boards, you're going to get a one-sided opinion. So with 25,000 journals, anything can get published. Data dredging enjoys a false respectability. Then there's the decade of reversal. These are two papers, one from uh, Mayo Clinic, and this was uh, from a British journal. And this went and studied the New England Journal of Medicine. You can't get any better science than that, right? It's Boston and all that. All original articles in 10 years, 2001 to 2010, of the 363 articles testing standard of care, 20, uh, uh, 146, 40.2% reversed the practice. So, you know, spin the wheel, coffee good, spin the wheel, coffee bad. The problem is that guidelines are published more often than not based on opinion and less on data, and we have to deal with that. And that's what leads to this reversal. And it's nothing new because the, the British did it uh, way back. Uh, they, they did over 800 clinical investigations. This was uh, published in 2011. This was published two years later. This is where the idea, look to Europe. That's where we always find out about things that are coming. Uh, should be asked to issue guidance to the NIH on disinvestment away from established interventions that are no longer appropriate or effective and do not provide value for the money based on previous tests, previous guidelines. I mean, standard of care was radical mastectomy. I haven't seen a radical mastectomy in over 15 years. And gallbladder surgery, I can remember when they put a moratorium in New York on laparoscopic gallbladder because people were learning too fast and killing too many people. I, I can only remember two open gallbladders in the past two years of practice because they couldn't do it laparoscopically. So sure, medicine changes, but the physiology doesn't, the basis of medicine doesn't. And getting back to advertisement, these guidelines are written by people sitting on pharmaceutical and medical device boards who are trying to help sell their their uh, uh, implements of destruction. I mean, all of those AICD patients out there that I see come into my practice every day where they've never gone off once, if your ejection fraction's below 40% for a long time or 35% for uh, six months after an MI, you're a candidate. And they're putting these things in. And when I worked at the Cleveland Clinic, we killed people sometimes taking them out because they get grown in there and the batteries go dead and you got to pull it out. And if you had one, well, we have to put another one in when it comes out anyway. And so every seven to 10 years, you're, you're burning these things out of people with, with eczema lasers to replace them. And you know, yeah, people, I think a 2% severe morbidity mortality is associated with the removal of a pacemaker lead. So that's the other reality. Selection bias and residual confounding. Retrospective studies, when you start doing risk adjustments, who's making the decision? The guy's writing the, 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 the uh, study. And these, these ABMS studies, they don't go for IRB review at a, at a university uh, where the usual standards reside. Oftentimes, there is no IRB review. They do it internally within their board to do that. Sample size, I've talked about p-values we know about. The bigger the retrospective analysis, the easier it is to get a p-value that looks good, and it's also easier to make nonsense. Then we have the Choosing Wisely program. I want you all to be aware of what this is. The ABIM came out and said, we're testing too much. We're wasting too much money. If we stop wasting money on needless testing, we will be able to pay for the Obamacare down the road. But these are the same people who are selling MOC needless testing to us with no value because they're the sole proprietors. 
and they've gotten every specialty to come on with five things, and some things are pretty clear-cut, straightforward. You know, uh, you don't do this if they don't need it because they don't need it. That's pretty straightforward. But the problem is the flagrant, obvious falsity of it all to say that, well, we're going to test every doctor. We're going to have a 33% failure rate. Wait a minute. A medical test that had a 33 false positive rate, you'd never, you'd never order it. So false negatives, false positives, Bayes' theorem, we know that I don't get an EKG on everybody because if they're under the age of 20, I'm going to find abnormalities that aren't there and I'm going to go to different, uh, I have to do a heart cath or something to figure out why that's there, although there's no reason to. We as physicians stand there and make a risk benefit analysis on all the tests, on all the patients, whereas the NPs and the PAs, they look at the guidelines and say, oh, there we go, we better do that and we'll waste the money. However, using the Bayes' theorem on the MOC testing with a 33% false, you know, stupid rate, positive rate, uh, I, in 2011, I analyzed the data from the Ohio State Medical Boards. They have Freedom of Information Act. Use the Freedom of Information Act in your state. You'll be surprised the information you can get. And in Ohio, you write them, you ask them a question, you number it one through 10 so that they have to answer the question. You will be given the data if it is there. And I went through that and I found that 167 actions against physicians resulted, were, were, were uh, obtained out of over 2,000 uh, uh, um, instances of reports of bad medicine. And of the 167, zero were for incompetence. It was, you know, sex with a patient, writing narcotic prescriptions for money, uh, alcoholism, drug abuse, things, you know, things that are not going to be picked up by the MOC or the MOC tests. So it's a waste of money, but the incidence was less than 0 0.005. Very low incidence, but yet they're finding 33% of stupid doctors. So that tells me there's something very wrong with the test. Now, what other unethical behavior is yeah. going on? They paid for this publication. The ABMS paid this journal to publish. This is all their articles. They got one from the United Kingdom and one from the Canada, which those programs are more like American CME-based products, but the ABMS is doing it. And they paid $50,000 to publish this crap. And you see here Rebecca, Rebecca Lipner is one of the editors. And this had over 250 uh, references. And all these guys receive royalties, senior valuation, American Board of I mean, this is a product from them. And they looked at, for example, study involving patients with acute myocardial infarction demonstrated a link between board certification and higher compliance with evidence-based processes of care, as per their definition. And you know, this is this down here, as well as significant reductions in mortality and length of the hospital stay, which are these references here. And when we look at that, well, we see there's Lipner and there's Lipner and there's Lipner, and we see that it's from 2002 back to 2000. And this is another one of those retrospective data reviews, but this. And this thing here, we'll see, said there was no difference, but that doesn't come out in this paper. Um, this is the, the, in elderly patients with acute myocardial infarctions, board certification was not associated with differences in 30-day mortality, okay? 30-day mortality. They have no conflicts of interest report, but uh, he's from the board, you know? Oh, well, okay, all right. So this is their data and results, and I'm sorry about the, the, the typo here, but if you look, here you say, uh, where's the 30, 30, your one year mortality, 30 day mortality. The one year mortality, the, the lower number means that it's 0.2% more likely that certified family practice, certified internists, and certified cardiologists seem to provide better care. No, 0.98 is no difference than 1.0. It's the same number, okay? But they wanted to emphasize that there was no difference here because certified internists had a higher number by exactly the same height. It was uh, the certified internal medicine, you know, 0 0.07 higher. So, but they wanted to emphasize that because their, their study, they did this, and this is more contemporary, refuted the previous ones which Lipner wanted to publish. Um, they also said a meta-analysis of the literature prior to 1999 found that those studies used appropriate methodology, 16 findings that showed a positive association Balarkey. This, this is the quote. There were only 13 studies included. 
and uh, the meta-analysis were not feasible due to viability and outcome measures across study, and this is the reference, this is the study where they concluded few published studies use research methods appropriate for the research question, and it was not possible to do a, a, a meta-analysis, but Libner's going to tell you in her article that, yes, that is. And if you look at it, um, there has been no systemic review examining the link between certification and clinical outcomes. And this thing, this study they did identified 1,200 papers, selected 237 based on subject relevance, reduced to 56, and identified only 13 of which only one was not a retrospective review. And I could go on for another half hour, and I yeah. would have loved to, but I <laughs> but think you I'm can't. Gonna, but I can't. <laughs> so if you have more questions, I'll be happy to answer them, and I'll open it for questions at this yeah. time. We have time for about two questions, okay? Paul, great talk. Thanks so much. Uh, what you point out is so true. Ver uh, reading the literature is a complete waste of time, unfortunately, for doctors. Most of it is junk science. So at least 95% of it is junk science. These huge studies with minimal clinical benefit and you know massive numbers to get you a positive p-value. And my suspicion is that, as you hint, uh, the agenda behind this, what is pushing this really is the, is the desire to not, not only make money for these companies, but the big money interests behind this are the uh, industry pushing guidelines through MOC. That's all they could be wanting to do, is to get doctors to brush up on these guidelines and learn the guidelines and force them uh, that way to follow them. Because there's, the, there's nothing else new out there. I mean, if I, you, doctors learn by practicing medicine. You have a patient, you have a, a problem. I can within seconds get a consult from a friend via, via a text message. I can within seconds get the latest literature in up-to-date, review physiology, review pathophysiology. You don't need to re revisit this stuff every 10 years. It's a complete scam. I agree completely. All right, one more. Here. Oh, so many. Uh, I think it's really important that you point out that there's no boards in Europe. Is there something else that they have there? Do they have the equivalent of CME, or is it just absent? They have a private corporation that does revalidation, which is more physician-directed and, and emulates the CME-based uh, validation of learning that we have here. The problem with this is if you don't stop them in the Rhineland, they keep growing and growing. And in anesthesia, we've got to do simulation courses for $2,000 every five years. The tests, they say it costs nothing, but it costs $2,000 to sign up and $2,000 to take. Then there's the whole Ted Pearson testing industry out there with their centers throughout the country where what, what people love is you got to get your vein pattern stamped on a scanner. Uh, it'll be a retinal scan soon, I'm sure. They take your wallet, they take your cell phone, they take everything away from you. You go in there and you got to deal with a computer program. And those of us with bifocals take a special set of glasses because you get real, real, you know, some people pass out <laughs> tilting back to look at the screen. And those with BPH, make sure you take your Avidar, because if you have to go to the bathroom, that's a whole other issue and it comes out of your time. So in reality, we have the internet, we have colleagues to make important decisions for patients based on the patient, and in the test, you're regurgitating some guideline, which was really designed to force you to buy into the new machines and the new drugs. But anyone wants to talk to me, I'm here for you. Thank you very much for listening. Go AAPS.